Greetings, ladies and mental gents, and welcome to this daily science fiction extravaganza, commonly known as Tales, Tales from Out from space. Out, space, out, space. Out, space. Taken from the subreddit HFY. All the relevant links will be down below. And, as always, I hope that you enjoy. And if you do, please consider supporting the channel. On to the science fiction. Story number one, the Cludian Geometry. Written by Skag Hunt. A straight line is the shortest distance between two points in a space. I continued drilling my lessons into Bahelem. Nonsense, he replied over radio frequency. The shortest distance between two points depends on their relative orbits and your ability into plotting orbital maneuvers. It was always elliptical. We're getting nowhere. Again, I shrugged. Perhaps we should adjourn for the day. I need to think of a better way to teach you geometry. Very well then. I eagerly await your next lesson. Behelium replied, his massive organic thrusters powered up, spewing a blue flame as he changed orbit, probably to devour some unfortunate ethanol cloud nearby. His gigantic ellipsoid body steadily faded from the view till there was a mere speck in the void. Any luck this time? Amy asked. Of course not, I replied. We're Earth's best mathematicians. We came to this extrasolar outpost to share advanced mathematical concepts with a brilliant alien species. And here we are struggling to make them understand a goddamn straight line. My outburst caught the attention of everyone in the mess hall on the ESO touring. I expected to be reprimanded, but just most nodded in agreement and continued with their meals. Orientation lecture, Station Master Nagarg fidgeted as he was brought up to the slide. This lecture was for the new recruits. I was well into my rotation, but I attended it anyway. Perhaps there was something I missed the first time around that would give me a better idea of how the students think. The Bolith are the most unique species that we have ever encountered, Nagaraj started. Firstly, they live in a vacuum of space. Nagaraj switched slides, showing their unbelievable physiology. Giant space whales is a crude but nevertheless apt way of describing our new friends. Nagaraj continued, eliciting nervous chuckles from the audience. Nagaraj wasn't wrong. The Bolith possessed a gaping maw surrounded by tentacles at the front of an array of embedded thrusters at the back. Their entire bodies were lined with eyes and other senses, resembling a biblical angel or an eldritch abomination, depending on your perspective. You all know that sound doesn't travel in space, and light gets only so far before dissipating, especially here. The Bolith therefore communicate using organic radios embedded somewhere within their bodies. Unfortunately, we have not had the opportunity to perform an autopsy, so we can only speculate about its design. Nagaraj changed slides. What I find even more fascinating about them is their evolutionary origins. As you all know, the Algola B star system is extremely young and carbon-rich. Planets have not yet coalesced around the star. Instead, the star is surrounded by a mass of dust belts rich in organic compounds and heavy metals. We believe that life originated in the dust. Indeed, we have isolated innumerable microbial species from the dust that gunks up our solar panels. The audience laughed sporadically. Over time, this life evolved to more complex forms, eventually producing our friends, the Bolith. Now, unlike anything else in the system, the Bolith have evolved a high degree of intelligence. Food for the Bolith is randomly distributed in small pockets of mineral and organic material following vastly different orbits. The Bolith need to expend as little fuel as possible, while well, visiting the largest number of food pockets possible. They have therefore developed the ability to innately solve complex problems involving orbital mechanics and can produce solutions far superior to those of the best astrophysicists. The audience muttered, but Nagaraj continued. Indeed, they have been generous enough to solve many of our intractable problems, allowing the Alliance to greatly stretch its exploration potential. You are now here to return the favor. 
They're both half fascinated with our mechanical spacecraft and assorted tools. They want to understand the physics behind our inventions. To teach them our physics, we need to first teach them our mathematics, and that is why you're all here. You'll be tutoring the individual Bolith on Earth's mathematical concepts. Needless to say, this is an important mission. The Alliance and Earth are both counting on you. Nagaraj ended the presentation on the note and dismissed the audience. Oh, one more thing. Nagaraj interjected before the audience left the conference room. Some tutors report that the Bolith have difficulty understanding a few elementary concepts, so do be patient with our new friends. That may have been the understatement of the century. The Bolith were quick to grasp basic algebra and a few advanced fields of topology, but all of them rode the short bus when it came to basic geometry. As frustrating as the situation was, I could understand it from their point of view. A species that never traveled in a straight line had no use for such a concept. Attending a station master Nagaraj's lecture was a waste of time. I gained no new insights. In my frustration, I headed back to my quarters and slept through the rest of the day. Any new ideas? Amy asked. It was 0700 hours, and the mess lighting simulated dawn. I slowly slipped my coffee and nodded at Amy, gesturing that I was as lost as her. Remember that you are not alone, Amy responded. We're all struggling with this assignment. I didn't respond back. After a brief silence, Amy continued. I found that taking up a new hobby has helped me cope. Let me show you. Amy pulled out a flute and started playing a tune of Dixie, of all things. Despite her best efforts, her notes were shrill and out of tune. The unintentional humor of the situation forced me to laugh uncontrollably. I'm not that bad, Amy whined back at me. She tried her best to appear offended. Oh, no you're not. You have the makings of a prodigal flutist. I'm just sure that your flute that's bad. I said between my outbursts of laughter, hand me the flute, I'm sure there's something blocking the cavity. As I jokingly peered through the front end of the flute, I was struck by an epiphany. Amy, I think you just saved this mission. I said just as I ran into the control room and radioed Behelium and time then place of our next lesson. Behelium was right on time, as usual. Today's lesson would take place in the close orbit around the object P-84, a small, dense, remarkably spherical asteroid measuring straight over a kilometer in diameter. In a billion years, the large planet would coalesce around it, crushing, then melting its lead into a fiery planetary core. It was 1800 hours. Being outside my shuttle in an EVA suit, I had no visual cues about the time of day. Agala B star shone directly behind me, brightly illuminating object P84 and giving me the impression of a perpetual loon. Behelium maneuvered to match my slow, serene orbit a mere hundred meters above the surface, casting an impressive shadow on the surface of object P84 that easily dwarfed mine. I was struck by the irrational but primal fear of being devoured by an approaching monster. Why have you chosen to meet here? Why are you not inside your shuttle? It is unsafe for your kind to be outside. The helium radioed in. It is essential for today's lesson, I responded. Very well then, what will you teach me? The helium inquired. Let's continue where we left off. A straight line is the shortest distance between two points in space. And as I said before, that is nonsense, Behelium replied. The shortest path between two points is always an ellipse. I maneuvered towards Behelium, choosing the eye that was closest to his tentacles. I unfurled a long, thin rod that grew to an impressive ten meters in length. A straight hole in the diameter of the fine needle was precisely drilled in the bottom of it. The rod remained perfectly straight despite the light weight. Now, do you recognize this shape? I asked Behelium, showing him the rod. Yes, it is a cylinder. This shape is a derivative of a straight line, he responded. Therefore, this cylinder cannot be the shortest path between two points. Correct, I inquired. That is correct, Behelium responded. Have you realized the error in your thinking? Not yet, I continued. The cylinder is hollow. I want you to point it at P84 and look through it. I don't see the point, but I'll do as you say. 
Behelium grabbed the cylinder at his tentacle. He won't be able to see anything, though. Behelium cut himself off just as he peered through it. I, um, can, uh, see light. He muttered in disbelief. Yes, you can. I responded before pressing on. Now tell me, within the same medium, does light travel through the shortest path between two points? Logically, it should, Behelium responded. Light will only take a longer path if it's obstructed. This means that the light is taking the shortest path through the cylinder, which means the shortest path between two points is a line. Correct, I replied. It was hard to suppress the jubilation that I felt in that moment. I still don't believe it, Behelium responded. What if the cylinder traced out an ellipse? I thought you'd ask, I replied. You'll find that cylinder is flexible. Bend it to whatever shape you wish. Behelium spent the next few hours bending the cylinder to trace all manner of ellipses, angles, and sinusoids and helices. He stopped only after he was finally convinced that the light could travel through no other path. I now understand why your species has built so much while we've built nothing. Behelium spoke. You intuitively understand physics in a manner that we will never... Nonsense, I responded. You are just as capable as we are. You only have to let go of your preconceived notions, and you'll be building space outposts in no time. Behedian flooded my radio channel with an incoherent but strangely periodic static that the linguists had told me was an negligence to an laughter. The translator still had problems with the onomatopoeic sounds. Thank you, he finally said. Today's lesson was most fruitful. I must eat now, but I eagerly await your next lesson. Behelium bid fed well as his thrusters ignited gently. He took great care to not fry me as he departed. I stayed in my EVA suit long enough to see him disappear into a spect. You madman, you actually did it! Amy was ecstatic as the rest of the mess hall. News spread fast and everyone not on duty, including the station master Nagaraj, had gathered to congratulate me as soon as I arrived back on the outpost. Long story short, I owe it all to your fruit, I responded. Please honor us by playing it. Amy was reluctant at first, but eventually gave in after the crowd repeatedly chanted, Play the flute! Play the flute! The whole station spent the night drinking and dancing to a very crappy rendition of Dixie. End of story. Story number two. Human Terminator, written by Hard Light Serial. In a certain Chitoxi University, as many aliens study the fields of science as natives, a pair of Chitoxi mates are currently firing a uranium ion stream through the force field and measuring the degree of scatter. But in a nearby chemistry lab, a third is using a mass spectroscopy to identify the makeup of a specimen of the Reich homeworld. And in one particular office, the planet's leading expert on time travel is being scolded by his new boss. And to get that far without someone realizing the dangers is just, uh, it's unbelievable. How the hell did you get this approved? The small, intelligent Chitoxi lowers his head and stares at his perch. I'm sorry, sir, if we weren't thinking cautiously. And why didn't you or the previous team consult any of folders on this? Well, we weren't aware of any other species were closer to cracking the puzzle than we were. I never imagined that humanity might have access to a working telecron. We don't. The human's voice is calm yet firm. It was as if his means to deny the possibility that humanity would even attempt to make one. Then, uh... How did you know the experiment was dangerous, and why would other humans also know? The human sighs and sits back down. These lowers downs into the Xeno, but no less authoritative. Son, you are familiar with the concept of dangerous technology. Of course, if it wasn't for the atom bomb conspiracy, I might not be here. Our species might not be here. And how did the Chitoxi know not to research nuclear weapons? What told you to cut the lion off and bury it? Theoretical models, of course. The human, eyes raised and waiting for the Xeno to reach. Oh, why? Because we had a head start. Humanity has been trying to crack that nut far longer than we've had to tech to make it work. And what did you learn from all those years? Not to do it. Time travel's dangerous, son. I'll help you find another team to join, because I'm shutting this lab down. 
Months later, some scientists found himself seeking the human dean's approval for another project. This time, the meeting was in the human's office, and something catches the Zeno's eye. The human has a retro DVD collection, and one of the titles seems familiar. It's called Terminator. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this dose of science fiction fun. I hope that you enjoyed. And if you did, please don't forget to support the author from the link down below. But if you want to support this channel, there are links as well down below for you to help with. But the easiest way would be to share this video. And if you are so inclined, subscribe as well. I will see you all in the next episode, and I hope that you all have a fantastic time until then. Cheers.